having left Mississippi, having uh, came out as being a, a gay man from Mississippi and speaking out on issues such as LGBT rights, um, I lost a lot um, in that moment, in that season. But I gained so much um, in that moment, and in that season. All right, this is Chris Brothers Me Podcast, where we discuss the black LGBT issues and topics, but mainly we interview the innovative, the daring, and the bold uh, with productive topics for the black LGBT. Now, I have a guest. Uh, this particular guest is actually writing a book, which I'm very interested in hearing more about, titled Those Who Give a Damn, A Manual for Making a Difference. Now, that is something quite needed in today's world. You know, I think Mr. Trump probably needs to read it as well. But uh, <laughs> we won't go into that quite yet. Uh, Mr. Mr. Malone is his, his name, but I want to I want to make sure I pronounce his first name correctly. Duvalier. Duval, uh, uh, can you help me with that? <laughs> help me help me with the here. You know? it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Duvalier. 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 Okay. He just told me, and I forgot that quickly. All right, Duvalier. Mm-hmm. All right. Malone. How you doing, Mr. Malone? <laughs> I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. You know, you know, it's very, you know, you normally get a lot of books that, you know, talk about, you know, making a difference, self-help. What, what, where would you put this particular category? What would you categorize your book as a self-help book or what would you categorize? So I would categorize it as a, a non nonfiction, um, not necessarily a self help book. It is um, in, in between a memoir as well as a manual uh, on how I started to uh, give a damn about my community, which um, as I talk about in the book, we all have a story. And sometimes our story starts at the beginning, which uh, how we're raised. And so the very first chapter uh, talks about uh, my upbringing and what set me on this path of community service and speaking up against injustices in uh, my community. And it takes you through uh, pretty much just how I started uh, on this journey of making a difference in my community. Interesting. And so you you come up pretty much from very humble, humble beginnings, is that correct? Yes, very humble uh, beginnings. I uh, grew up on a farm in Mississippi, um, in Harrison, Mississippi, right outside of uh, the city of Fayette, Mississippi. And um, the first part of my life, my mom and dad, and we lived next door to my grandmother. And um, at the age of 12, my mom and dad went through a really harsh divorce. My dad uh, battled with mental illness. And so at that point, it uh, led us into poverty. Uh, So very humble beginnings there in Mississippi. I know what it's like to uh, go to school and come home not knowing whether or not you would have food on the table. Uh, But again, those humble beginnings instilled something in me uh, to want to do better and to want to, when I get out of this situation, to reach back and to help other people. And so that's what the uh, manual uh, of those who give a damn talks about that journey and charting people through uh, my life journey. Okay. And now when it comes to through that journey, what do you think people are going to well, matter of fact, let's just uh, start back in the very beginning. So once your parents divorced, um, and of course, you know, at that point, two incomes in the house are no longer, you know, you, your father's going through mental health. First off, what's going through the head, what's going through the brains of a, of a child enduring all of this situation at this moment? You know, at that time, I talk about it in the book, how I had lost hope. I remember a time uh, that we were leaving to go to school, my sister and brother and I, uh, to get on the bus. And, of course, we had no food. And at the time, I said, you know, my mom said, God is going to provide for us uh, food on the table when you guys get home. Um, And I can't, and because I had been through uh, so much with with, with my parents and that, that divorce and just the mental uh, illness of my father. Some days we would uh, get up and we would, we would be woke, woke up by him beating on the, the, the trailer it was because I lived in a mobile home there in Mississippi, and he would be beating on the trailer to get us up. And so going through all of that, you know, uh, fear whether or not something would happen to your mom while you're at school. So some days we would stay at home and wouldn't go to school just because we were worried about the, uh, my mom. And then so, you know, my young 12 stuff had given up hope. 
But my mom said, I believe that God is going to provide for us. And I got home, and one of my mom's friends, uh, Regina Reed, I would never forget it, brought my mom over a box of, of, of groceries, and we had food to eat. Um, and so very, um, um, very humble beginnings. But again, uh, it's still in me a foundation that I, I stand on today, that when I am having difficult situations, in my adult life, uh, whether or not I'm making the right decisions, going through challenges as we all do on this journey we call life, I always remember what my mom said that God would provide for me. So I grew up in very, very um, um, a, a faith-based environment there with my mom. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my 12 year self. Just um, had lost hope, uh, lost hope. So you know, it sounded to me that you know, really, uh, some sort of a faith or religious background definitely kept the process going. Is that something that you think that people are missing in today's world that really, because I think the last statistics I, I saw was that, a, well, people of color in particular, we stay within it, um, even though some of us may not necessarily believe the same way we used to believe as an adult. So do you believe by having some sort of a foundation such as religion or, uh, or faith in some capacity is kind of the thing that really helps pull everyone through? It does. It does. And you know what? Um, and you asked me this earlier, something that, you know, somebody would be surprised about in the book, but it does. So I'm going to answer a question and then it leads way into something else that's in the book. But I do believe that growing up, I grew up in a, a very religious uh, home um, and, you know, it, it, it gave me that foundation to believe in something that's greater than myself. Um, and I call that God. Uh, and having grown up in, in the church and then going in through my adult life, I had an opportunity to uh, attend a, a more diverse church when I lived in this, uh, Mississippi uh, that taught me different views and different ways to look at uh, religion and different things. But I'll say this, I do believe that it does. But as you get older, you also create your own ideas and your own philosophies around what you uh, call faith or religion. And I believe that on this journey, we all have something on the inside of us yearning for something greater than ourselves. And, and I call it God. Some people call it light. Some people, you know, call it faith, whatever we call it. I do believe being raised in um, in the church, it is still um, a foundation in me that I still stand on today. You know, most of the time, at least when you look at af athletes, this is, I'm going to use them as an example, most of the time they, they want to get out. <laughs> they just want to simply just, whatever it is I got to do to get out of the environment, not necessarily to stay within the community, but to basically get out. Do you think that one of the process of growing um, in order to be able to help your community better is mainly to get out of that community for a time period. Is that something that you believe? Um Absolutely. In my book, I speak about that, how I battled with uh, moving from Mississippi uh, to Washington, D.C., had knowing that I had done very well in Mississippi um, and had made a lot of grounds there to make impact in my community there. I knew that in order for me to grow, I needed to get out of that environment of Mississippi to be able to uh, grow more, to be able to have a seat at the political table of power here in Washington. Uh, and in that, moving from Mississippi to Washington, D.C., this is where this book came from. I was When I lived in Mississippi in 2012, I started working on this book, and the book was just a manuscript of me going through, writing down everything I had went through in life as a way of therapy, so just talking that out. Uh, but when I moved to Washington, D.C., the book title changed, the message of the book changed, because I found um, a new Duvalier, uh, a better Duvalier. Not that I was uh, bad in Mississippi, but I'd grown. Uh, I was able to uh, start speaking up. One of the very first things that I did was spoke uh, spoke up against the governor of Mississippi regarding HB 1523, a bill that would have allowed businesses and religious organizations to discriminate against the LGBT community, and had been a man of faith and been a man in the church and in Mississippi, that was one of the most hardest things I had ever done. But I talk about in the book how this young man sent me an email, and he said, I was receiving the top uh, 50 under 40 award in Mississippi. And this young man said, my mom look up to you. She l listens to your radio broadcast all over Mississippi, uh, but she hates me uh, because I'm gay. And at that moment, I knew that I talk about this in the book that I had made a mistake. Um, I had used my platform and what God had blessed me in Mississippi 
to initiate change on poverty, education, and economic development. Those are all really um, uh, good issues, but there are also issues that I think most of Americans believe that nobody should be in poverty, that we should help one another. We believe that we, we believe in education in this country. So those are very uh, um, issues, not such hard controversial issues. Uh, but for me, the issue of uh, my sexuality and the LGBT community was something of controversy for me. But having getting out of my environment of Mississippi, it allowed me to stand in my truth. And I talk about that in my upcoming book, how, you know, standing in my truth allowed me to find my voice. So my truth gave me my voice. Uh, it's a very small chapter um, of the book. It's the end of the book, but it talks about um, me leaving Mississippi. Uh, it talks about how I found my voice by speaking up on these issues and accepting uh, being a gay man, because for so long we can't say I'm gay or I'm a gay man. But in moving to D.C., I'm able to stand in that truth. Um, hope I answer your question. I think yeah, you I kind of got you did. long I mean, winded there. I mean, you did. <laughs> and when I, when I start to look at, because it sounded like to me you were definitely more involved. What, what was actually your position in D.C., if you don't mind me asking? So when I came here, I actually came here uh, with my own organization, Duval Game Malone Enterprises. And what we do is we um, do just like what I did in Mississippi, provide resources, information, uh, media uh, outreach to uh, communities, underprivileged communities in the areas of education, economic development, uh, and poverty. So my organization, uh, we write columns, we put on events that brings information and empower people uh, to be them better selves, uh, and also consult with different nonprofits on ways to allocate um, and get funding uh, from Washington and back to their communities. Uh, you know, that's, I, okay, that's actually pretty interesting because uh, do you find that a lot of people, at least particularly people of color, you know, and th that actually really truly supported you in the D.C. area or you found that more politicians were more on board with what you were doing or both? So I'll tell you what, I think both, but in the also in regards of support, um, having left Mississippi, having uh, came out as being a, a gay man from Mississippi and speaking out on issues such as LGBT rights, um, I lost a lot um, in that moment, in that season, but I gained so much um, in that moment, in that season. And I'll say this, I really don't measure the, I haven't measured like the support of who who it comes from. And that may sound weird. I used to, uh, when I lived in Mississippi, but now I believe that every moment, every encounter that I, uh, everything that I encounter in, on this journey that I call life um, is a, a purpose, a purpose filled moment. So I don't necessarily really get too caught up in the supporters or, and I tell my, my, I tell my mentees this all the time. They laugh at me because I say, you know, on social media, um, some days I may get one like the next day I may get a thousand, but every time I walk in the airport in Mississippi and across the country, people can tell me what I'm doing based on my social media and following. And I say all that to say, I try not to get caught up in the support. I try to stay uh, focused on the mission. I'm so grateful for my supporters. Uh, and there are people from all different backgrounds. But when I came here, I didn't necessarily, start, I didn't start, I didn't measure anything that I get more support from politicians or community leaders of the LGBT community. I think I think I've received equal support from all those different environments, and um, I, I, every day I'm gaining new support from so many different people all across the country. Just like yourself, uh, uh, five years ago, I probably would have never been on a podcast. Uh, like <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's my point. You know, on this on this journey that we call life is you know you reaching out and we, and you and I uh, having this conversation today is another element of support from all different um, parts of society. You, you know, I, when I see, you know, what things are happening currently, especially with uh, some of the students in gun control, do, where do you see the youth currently when it comes to giving a damn and in terms to finding themselves? And where do you see where they're going when you see things like this uh, playing off on television? 
let me tell you what, I honestly believe more than ever, and I was so encouraged when I saw um, all the uh, activists that were birthed, uh, and some people call those babies activists. I, I don't necessarily, and I agree, I saw a political commentator who said they're not necessarily, Soledad O'Brien, when she was talking, they're not necessarily, they, they have been thrust into activistness, and I believe that that is uh, powerful because I think we all uh, are activists in our own right. Uh, but those young people in our future is so bright because they used a tragedy situation. They used an opportunity that, that and, and turned that tragedy into triumph by using their voices uh, to speak up and to speak out against injustice as it relates to gun control. And so all across the country, this was just one big movement that we see. But as I travel across the country and as I talk to young people, they are more uh, outspoken than ever. And I think this generation is going to show us another side of activist, uh, activism through social media and all the different means that they have because they're not afraid to speak up. They're not afraid to take the road less traveled. They are, they are okay with being different and to be themselves. And I believe, um, and me and my partner talk about this all the time, how we may be borderline on the um, uh, millennium generation. Uh, because for me, I grew up thinking I had to uh, dress a certain way. I had to talk a certain way. I had to be a certain way. But these young people, more than ever, if you look at the rally on yesterday, they wasn't dressed like, uh, on, I'm, I'm sorry, on Saturday, they wasn't dressed like Dr. King. They wasn't dressed like Representative yeah. John Lewis. They was them. They were they, they, they were their authentic selves, and I believe that is going to be the gift to this new generation. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. A part of me says, and and I guess, because sometimes I have these discussions, and sometimes many people disagree with me, so it's okay if you can disagree with me. I think in many respects, sometimes education creates selfishness. And sometimes you don't want to give your time towards something that's not going to benefit you financially. A lot of times, and I think at least in my generation, I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty much part of Generation X. And along the way, we got more educated, but we kind of pulled away from activism a little bit. And I think that's because a lot Absolutely. of us got, I think, I think a lot of us, quite frankly, just got a little bit more selfish. It became about us, mm -hmm. me, stocks, options. <laughs> and it, it never, it, it kind of pushed away from that activism, uh, uh, from empowering your own community to where you want to move out the community and never come back again. Uh, you know, it, I, I don't know exactly what mm -hmm. happened. What do, is there anything that maybe you agree with me or not, but is there anything that you I felt? Do, I do agree. I do agree, and that's one of the reasons why I decided to go out um, and, and to um, go ahead on and produce this book in this season. I believe everything happens um, on time, and it's, um, it's in perfect season. Um, I believe when you look at our community, um, for me, uh, having grew up and had that tragedy of poverty and had made a commitment to myself, I definitely believe that that's what instilled in me that ability to want to always reach back to my community. Uh, but we do find that some sometimes we get caught up in our bubbles and we it's easy to lose focus of where we came from as a people and where we need to uh, continue to go to be able to stay in that moment. But I, I also believe that history has a way of repeating itself. It's not by accident that we have a president like President Trump now. It allows us to see the consciousness of our country. But at the same time, you see people who were who was once in their bubbles. Now they're speaking up and they're speaking out. And so I think what we what 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 I think it does is, is just like anything, when we get caught up in our environments, history. John Lewis always say this that you know what was so powerful about the march in Washington was the fact that. Dr. King had delivered speeches all across the South and all across the country for years, but history had a way of arresting him on that day because it was the right time, it was the right season. And so I do believe that in that season where we saw a bunch of African Americans that were moving up, that was that season in our country, in our lives, right. for African Americans to thrive in ways that they had never thrived. But I also believe that now more than ever, you see that because we've got in our bubbles, now history has interrupted us to say, okay, it's time for us to get out, out of our bubbles and begin to speak up, to speak out, to begin to pool our funds together within our community to ensure um, 
that we have a seat at the political table power. But I absolutely agree with you that uh, as as people get educated, and I saw this on Instagram a couple of days ago, they said that uh, being black excellent isn't um, um, passport stamps and taking fancy trips or, you know, your big parties or whatever. And I do all of that. But I, I, the gist of what I took away from that was that I think for us, and so many people in our community, it's just so easy to get caught up in these bubbles and not reach back and make a, a difference in your community uh, in particular ways. And the way I'm making a difference in my community is going to be totally different than the next individual. But I True. think all of us collectively doing our part because we can't look down on people who were taking fancy trips or lived in great neighborhoods. That was my dream as a child, that I wanted to get out of the level of poverty, and I wanted to live in Washington, D.C., and live this amazing dream. And so for me, uh, it's not that I forgot about my community, but that was my dream. But to some, they may still think that I am in a bubble. You know, So it's all about our perspective, our views, and our values, uh, I believe, as well. Do you think this, the word community is the same as it was years ago? Because when I look at, because for me, when I look at, you know, times during the 60s, it was during a particular period where we were definitely segregated. And definitely during that particular period, many neighborhoods have thrived just because. And the minute, of course, you know, we diversity came in, we became uh, no longer segregation was legal, things definitely changed. Now, do you think that the sense of community is the same in terms of the meaning? Is it the same thing or just has been revamped a little bit? I think community is what what we define um, as community. And so I can't, I, I honestly believe that when we look at communities, they have evolved. But that doesn't mean that they are not the communities of the past. So when we, we, we and, I, and I, I always like to compare the past, but I think when we look at communities, I am excited of how communities are evolving to not be the community of the past. And so I think it all depends on the certain uh, geographical location. It depends on the, um, the background of the person or the or the individuals within that community to make up what a community is. I think you'll see a lot of the LGBT family, uh, for instance. I have what I call a chosen family, uh, people that are my, have became my chosen family on this LGBT uh, journey. So my point is it, it all depends on what we define as family, not necessarily that we have lost that sense of community, because I don't think we've lost the sense of community. I just think it has evolved. Gotcha. And because it has evolved doesn't mean that it's not the sense of community. I would want my kids and my in the future generation to be the same as I as what we perceive community today. That's not real growth. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, the title itself, Those Who Give a Damn. Why'd you chose that title again? <laughs> That's a pretty so you know, I'll, straight up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, starting off, when I first started writing this book, I told you it was, uh, it was not, that, that was not the title. Uh, but as I said, I moved to Washington, and I began to speak up on issues that affect the community. Uh, one in particular that I spoke up uh, on last year, which really brought me into uh, m- into a level of being an activist that I had never experienced before was Emmett Till. Uh, after the live Carolyn Bryan uh, that led to the murder of Emmett Till, uh, coming out that she had actually lied and uh, recanted uh, parts of her story, I organized the uh, We Demand Justice rally for Emmett Till. Uh, and so I've always kind of had a, uh, when I got the title uh, of the book, it was actually, uh, I was working on a, a manuscript for uh, an, uh, also a book that I'm working on, a high school manual uh, that I'll be releasing uh, very soon uh, that speaks to young kids and talks about uh, having uh, the uh, power of imagination. But in saying all that, um, actually, the uh, title of the book, Those Who Give a Damn, was part of some of the, uh, it was like a question, it was like a phrase, and then my partner and I sat there, and we was like, oh my God, what if I named the book, Those Who Give a Damn? A manual for making a difference mm-hmm. to kind of lighten the tone of it up. Uh, but more than ever, after that, I had secured the a title of the book and got it copyrighted immediately because it stood out to us in that moment, and I knew it would be something that was sent out to the world. So I sent all of my copyrights. But I battled still with the title song because I said, those who give a damn, it's going to be hard to get this book in schools just based on the title. The content of the book is positivity throughout the entire book, but the title. 
Um, and when I went to do the Emmett Till rally in Mississippi, I'll tell you what, more than ever, I left that rally knowing that I, over um, since 1955, this woman was carrying this lie. The author of the book got her message over a decade ago and didn't release it until he was actually dropping his book. And I said, more than ever, we need to give a damn about our community. And at that point, I didn't give a damn about what people thought about how bold the title was, because that young boy in 1955 was lynched and murdered based on a lie from a white woman, and then came back and, and, and recanted her story. But I questioned the integrity of the author to hold that 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 truth for so long. Yeah. So at that point, I didn't give a I didn't give a damn what people thought because I knew that I had to use this platform that I had to speak up and speak out against injustices in my community. Um, so yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, um, when I look at those who actually are changing their tune in terms of their their sense of activism, their sense of community, I think Trump, in my personal view, was an awakening. And you're right. It was there's there's a reason why he was definitely put in into ignite. And do you see much more uh, from the cities that you travel, the people you're talking to? Do you see a lot more coming about now? I do. I definitely do. Um, I see it. But one of the things that worries me about this generation, my generation, is the action. Uh, behind it because we are a very reactive generation so we are very reactive so for somebody like Donald Trump who's in office who is not as presidential as you know we are used to in America it's very easy to be very reactive but what are we doing in our communities to ensure the action part of it how many of us are going out and speaking and mentoring young boys in our communities how many of us are you know actually registering people to vote and get people out and so you know my partner reminds me this a lot he says you know having a conversation a couple of days ago he says you know more than ever we have to even evaluate ourselves as being in the community, making sure that we're following up with action as well. You know, what I did last year, making sure that I'm improving on that with even more action, because action is what I think is going to change the tune of our society. Uh, we live in an environment now that we all have platforms. Uh, we all have social media. We all have uh, the ability to get a message out. But what are we doing after we get that message out? Are we actually going and talking and, uh, you know, leading uh, young men in the right path, having mentorship programs, going to after-school programs, and actually sitting down with young boys and sharing words of wisdom? And so I really believe that more than ever, it's, 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 it's about the action, uh, because uh, Donald Trump will, will uh, be him. And we have had Republicans in office who uh, have been similar to Trump, and our communities have thrived. So I don't pay a lot of attention to that noise of this president uh, of what have you, because our country was great before President Trump, and it's going to be greater as a result of him being in office, but we have to ensure that we are moving forward with action in our community because action is what brings about change, you know, uh, not just us being reactive. You know, I agree with you, and I think in a way, and you know, cr you know, correct me if, uh, in, well, provide me your opinions on this one. I think in a way, social media has has trained our brains to receive instant gratification. Uh, in many respects, people like to receive that instant gratification. I feel good at this moment. Not necessarily taking into consideration, even a civil rights movement took strategy, took time, took uh, 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 realizing mistakes, and to be strategic in action. And that all that took time. All of that took time. And in my personal view, and it's just enough for the young ones, but this is also for the older ones, too. Um, I do believe you're correct when it comes to that, but I think we've been groomed at this time that if it isn't something that we receive now, if we're not about the now, then let's forget about the later because it takes a little bit extra time that a lot of people kind of give up in the process because it's very long, tedious process to make things occur. And so, you know, exactly. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, the, what, how do we get back to that is my question. How do we get back to understanding the process will be long, understanding the process will be a little tedious and beating us up a little bit, but to continue and strive despite. It is not going to be an instant thing. 
And you know, this may sound so um, simple, but it's yet so hard for so many in our community. It is to unify, to support each other, and to listen to every single person perspective and point of views on the issues at hand. Um, I, when I look at being an activist, and this is something that surprised me, how people ask me all the time, Devoye, you, you, you use your platform on social media and you share everybody's content that's moving forth on the Confederate flag in Mississippi getting it taken down. You move and you share everything on Emmett Till. You know, you're just, you are just a supporter at heart. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I get people who will not support, but they say they're activists for the flag. But they may not ever share your message. They may not ever come to your meeting. And until we unify in a way in our community where we are working together on one issue, the biggest thing for the civil rights movement was, hey, we don't want to have this segregation. And so segregation, among many other issues that 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 was, uh, you know, embedded in segregation. But the big picture was segregation. We want the right to vote. We want to have equal protection under the law. We want to no longer see white uh, restrooms and uh, black uh, and color restrooms. And so I think because they had such narrow focus in, in those times, it was easier to unify. We live in a society now where there's so many issues. I'm, I'm fighting to, you know, help bring down the Confederate flag in Mississippi, and I want justice for Emmett Till. But there are so many other people that are fighting for, you know, the LGBT community in Mississippi to have the right to vote. I've joined that effort and support it. But you know what I'm saying? And so it's so many different areas now that it's so hard to quantify uh, uh, a particular uh, focus point or to it's, it's harder to get people at the table and then leave the table and actually move forth again with action. You know, and that, Does that makes sense. It, no, it, well, because I, this is what I also see in terms of the process of getting started. Because you're right, there is an array of topics, an array of topics that people would love to tackle, but I think a lot of people really don't know exactly what to tackle first. <laughs> it seems like because there's just so many, but I think people also gravitate towards organizations that go towards a particular cause because at least they have a place to go. And to join and to have that process of what's what's how to start it is to start with some particular place that people feel safe to be able to join. And that's what I also see. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there maybe there are more organizations out there that probably are not being reached or maybe people just don't know about and people have no clue how to really get a hold of these type of things to be able to join. Is that also part of the process? Oh, yes. We live in also a society where we have uh, information overload. There are so many, uh, you know, community activists. There's so many different uh, people that are initiating change in their communities. And because of the um, information overload, uh, you just look for yourself. I'm sure you can attest to this with your podcast because there are so many thousands of podcasts. Ugh. How do you get your message out? Exactly. How do you in- initiate change? You know, because there are so many different authors. How do Duvalier get his message out? And, you know, that just comes with being consistent. That just comes with knowing your audience. And I tell people this all the time, and this is just my story. It's not a lot of people's story. It's my story. I do what I am uh, created to do every single day because I want to initiate that change in my community. Uh, and so whether that's three people or whether that's ten I'm going to continue to wake up every single day and speak up when I see injustice in my community and use my platform to make a difference. And I think that's what we have to, at the end of the day, instill in ourselves and in future generations, that if we all get up every single day and do what it is that we were created to do, then we all are going to initiate some very awesome change in our community. Now, I'm just just off the top for a minute. Your name. Your name, it sounds something like I've never heard of before, but it also sounds Haitian. Is it, is it of Haitian? Do you have Haitian background? 
I don't have a Haitian background. I'll tell you this story, and you uh, you are going to find very uh, <laughs> interesting. But my mom, um, have, she, when my mom was, um, um, after she had had my oldest brother and my youngest sister, she was unable to bear a child. Yeah. And so she was watching TV one day, and she said she wrote uh, on a, on, in her Bible, uh, Duvalier, uh, right? And so uh, in this Bible, she put it there and she said, if God ever blessed her with a child, she would name the child Duvalier. Um, my name is actually, I'm, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the uh, dictator of Haiti was named Papa Doc Duvalier, and his son was uh, Baby Doc Duvalier. And so that's where my mom got the name from. She didn't realize at the time that uh, uh, that the dictator was not as uh, popular in Haiti, of course, <laughs> but she loved the name. Okay. Uh, she loved the name. <laughs> and so here we are, you know, 31 years later in Duvalier, and I love politics and into politics. So it's ironic that, you know, I am actually uh, in line of doing politics and things like Duvalier, you know, as his son, baby Dr. Duvalier, done in Haiti. So that's all I have to tell people all the time. Names have meaning. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's funny that I would have a passion for politics uh, <laughs> like no, right. no other. And my name is from actually two dictators in Haiti. One one was his father, who wasn't a, a, a well-known dictator, but uh, Baby Dot actually uh, was able to change Haiti uh, and do some things and correct some things of his father. So, yeah, very interesting. But, yeah, that's where my name came from. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's so interesting because I, you're right. I, I had to look it up. I'm thinking to myself, okay, these I've never heard of that name before. It's a very unique, very, very unique name. So now that you are, you have the book out. First off, do you? Because I know you mentioned schools. Do you really want uh, children, uh, or do you want high school students? Who exactly you're trying to reach with this with this book? Well, with this book, we're trying to reach those change makers in our community, uh, those who are all, uh, speaking up and speaking out against injustices, those who may not be speaking out against injustices to be encouraged and to use this manual uh, to encourage them to use their platform. But one thing about this book, it's not just for political activists, it's not just for attorneys and people that are in politics. Uh, This is a a book that will encourage whether you are a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you are a general in the military, no matter what area you are in society, the goal is to encourage you that when you see something wrong, to speak up and to speak out against those injustices and to also find yourself in my journey of how you can use your own personal journey to initiate that change in your community. And many of uh, many young people are already speaking up and speaking out, and this is a way for them to be encouraged even more uh, and a better guide to uh, moving forth and being an activist. But at the same time, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a doctor, whether you are an attorney, no matter what part of society you, you're in, you can find yourself in this story. You know, I, I love to to hear that, and that's definitely one of the things that I think a lot of people will definitely should walk away with. Now, here, but here's one thing that also kind of kind of comes to mind when it comes to the sense of bravery, and when it comes to the sense of courage. Um, where exactly do you think our level of encouragement and our, our bravery really is? Because sometimes people don't really want to speak out, especially if they feel that they're going to receive backlash from it. And do you do you see that? also changing in terms of courage to be able to to change right now and do you think you'll be able to change that with this book it is when i tell you i see a level of courage because our society when we see things um in our community such as gun violence and uh active shooters going into our our schools and and uh, killing our babies and our educators then it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you're black or white, whether you're uh, a Baptist or whether you're a Pentecostal. I think our um, human side kicks in and it causes us to want to see change in our community. And so more than ever, I think some of these events, uh, as hurtful as they've been and as uh, heartbreaking as they've been, I think it has allowed our country um, to um, that that courage 
uh, that we are made up on. I like to think about the eagle, uh, you know, that, that eagleness that's on the inside of all of us in America has had to rise up uh, to find the courage to speak up and speak out against those injustices uh, because who wants to send their child to school uh, and to have to wonder whether or not they're going to come home safe? Right. Uh, those are safe havens in right. America. Now, when it comes to finding your book, where can people find your book? So it will be available on April 7th um, on Amazon.com. So they can find it on Amazon.com. And it also will be a link on my website at DuvalierMalone.com where they can also connect with me uh, on purchasing the book as well. And I'm also working uh, now to have the book placed in um, libraries and in bookstores across the country. So I've been getting those preview, I will be getting those preview copies out uh, this upcoming uh, week and month. And so uh, stay tuned because uh, my goal is to get this uh, book in as many communities across the country uh, as I can possibly can. Okay, all right, all right. Now, last last question, when it comes to three things you want people to take away from those book, from this book, what would you say that is? The three things I would say is the ability to find themselves in this story by when you see something wrong in your community, to speak up and to speak out. And the second thing is to always follow your passion. If you notice throughout, and, and, and when you get a copy of my book, you'll notice throughout every chapter is passion. And I believe that when passion connects with your destiny, then there in lies your purpose. Right. And so those are three things, purpose uh, as well, would be the last thing, because when, you're, when your destiny aligns with your purpose, it's, 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 it's an amazing thing, because destiny and purpose is, uh, I believe, intertwined together, um, and it's a powerful thing, and it's uh, contagious. It's contagious. So um, that's my goal that um, as people are reading the book and as this book is getting out all across the country, that it will be a, uh, a, a positive uh, change force that is contagious and that we'll see people use their influence and their circles of power to initiate that change that we so very need in this country and across the world. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate this conversation. And this now I think I got your name right. Okay, Duvanet. Duvanet. Du, right? Duvalier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Help me out Duvalier. here. <laughs> okay, Duval, okay, Duvalier. All right. <laughs> so I want to definitely make sure I'm going to keep all of your social media, uh, put all that information online as well as all, where can they actually get the book, etc., and also the release date. So definitely, I can honestly say, I really enjoyed this conversation. I definitely can see that Thank you. Uh, a lot of people can be able to connect with this book in many different aspects. And yes, people really should give a damn. So why wouldn't they want to at least find some sort of a manual to help them connect with that so i think this will definitely do very well thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate that no thank you thank you so much for having me not a problem not a problem at all what i'll do like i said everything i'm going to definitely let you know uh when everything gets out and i'm going to make sure that everyone knows as much as possible and this is for everybody out there listening please make sure you go get a copy of this book and guess what i'm, pr I'm pretty sure in your own neighborhoods there is a particular topic that you find of interest where you should give a damn and you should want to be a part of it in many different ways and to, the steps to go about it hey this is a great book to do it this is chris with mr duvanier <laughs> duvanier uh, malone signing off with brothers Speed podcast have a wonderful day